Okay, we are going to get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for today's CNCF webinar, Building Edge as a Service. My name is Jerry Fallon, and I will be moderating today's webinar. And we would like to welcome our presenter today, Dr. Bin Ni, <clears throat> excuse me, CTO at Wangsu Science and Technology and CD Networks. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or questions that are in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Nee to kick off today's presentation. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction of Gary. Uh, hello everyone. And uh, first of all, no matter where you're located in the world, I hope you and your family are staying safe and sound. Uh, my name is Bing Nee. I'm in charge of uh, the research and development of uh, CD Networks. Uh, from its name, I think some should be hard for some of you to guess that uh, we are a CDN company, uh, AKA Content Delivery Networks. So if you are not familiar with CDN, uh, I will give a very brief introduction to this presentation. Uh, but for now, you just need to keep in mind that uh, it has a lot to do with the edge. So although edge computing has uh, been relatively new, uh, it has been, I think, uh, only in the heart for a few years. But a CDN is a business that has been dealing with it for uh, more than 20 years. And in the last few years, uh, we have been working on to working on a uh, platform uh, to provide edge computing as a service to application uh, developers in a way similar to uh, cloud computing. Uh, yeah, so we had the uh, a lot of thinking we made up uh, during this process. Uh, so for example, how to make this uh, platform uh, flexible and powerful. Uh, in the meantime, uh, not overly complicated and hopefully easy for us to maintain and for the customers, for the users to use. And what changes uh, the application developers need to do on their application to take full advantage of the uh, edge computing uh, platform. Uh, so today I'm going to share some of uh, those ideas of us. Okay, so uh, since we are talking about edge computing, so we first need to answer this uh, fundamental question. So what is the, uh, what is the edge? Okay. Because today uh, when you uh, talk to people uh, that are doing edge computing, you may get a different answer from each of them. Okay. So they have a, a definite, definitely different uh, def uh, definitions of the edge. So here I listed a few places that someone can uh, deploy their applications uh, listed from the distance uh, to the end user. I think uh, the main benefit when, we when people talk about edge computing uh, is the uh, latency to the end user and also the, the bandwidth. So here, these five locations the first one is uh, just the central data center. Okay, so uh, in the old days, you just put all your applications uh, in that one data center. Okay, 
usually uh, no people would call it uh, the edge. Actually, it is the opposite of the edge. So the second one, uh, the cloud data centers, what I mean is the conventional cloud, just like AWS, Azure. So they usually have uh, 10 or 20 data centers all over the world. So if you want your app to have a good coverage of the end users, uh, the developer may probably uh, replicate their application logics uh, in multiple data centers all over the world to try to uh, minimize the latency to the end user. And the latency is usually in the order of um, 100, 100 milliseconds. And the third one is uh, CDN data centers. So I will show you a, uh, a picture, uh, give you more idea about how the CDN data centers looks like, the distribution looks like. So usually uh, the CDN data center usually tries to cover uh, every country usually has a, at least one or more pops in the most populous countries and all the major data, all the major ISPs so, uh, on the order of uh, a, a global CDN company usually has uh, at least 100 uh, pops all, all over the world to have a good coverage. And the latency is usually uh, at the order of uh, the ten tenths of milliseconds. And the fourth one I listed here uh, is a mobile carrier, MEC, uh, what they call a multiple access uh, center. And mobile, usually it, it means that you just put your the application developer, just put the application servers uh, very close to the mobile, the cell phone towers. So as you can imagine, there are probably um, thousands of them in one country and globally, there can be easily millions of them. Okay. Yeah, of course, it provides a uh, even reduced latency compared to the CDN centers. But the problem is that uh, you know, both the benefit and the problem is that there are just too many of them. Uh, and even Verizon today, they only provide this kind of service in a few US. So it's because there are so many of them, so it uh, becomes very difficult to, to manage that, the huge number of pops. So it will be even very difficult to cover, to cover even one country. So, but maybe this is the start of, uh, this, uh, of this technology. So at least now, um, they can only cover a few cities, even in the US. Yeah. And the last, uh, block I listed here is the end user devices. Okay, for example, your mobile phone or a security camera uh, in people's house or business. So in uh, a lot of uh, edge computing, the, 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 in, a, in a lot of uh, definitions of edge computing, people are uh, calling those devices as the edge. And of course, that, that is really the edge uh, in, in uh, some in strict sense, okay, because that, that is the end user. Okay. And the latency will be, uh, you, you can't beat the latency uh, if you define that to be the edge. So each of those definitions, uh, obviously from left to right, you will get uh, smaller and smaller latency to the end users. But in the meantime, uh, you will have a higher com uh, complexity. It becomes more and more difficult to manage. And in the meantime, the resources are lower uh, on the right-hand side. Okay. Usually the end user devices will have a very limited uh, computing power and storage compared to servers in data center. Or even M and the uh, uh, mobile MEC compared to uh, regular data centers, they usually have a limited space and power. So these are the possible locations uh, people can define their edge. And from our point of view, you know, we need to have a very good trade-off. And we, of 
for CPD at the CDN data center should be the way to go. And I will, uh, because of the reason I just introduced, we believe this, this uh, CDN, the distribution of CDN data center provides a very good balance between the latency bandwidth people want from the edge computing and also from the uh, complexity from the manageability point of view. Okay, this page uh, gives you, hopefully can give you some uh, more idea about how the CDN edge look like. Okay, so each of this uh, red dot represents a uh, CDN, one or more CDN pops. Okay, so actually th this is a, the, the CDN networks, uh, CDN network, the edge network. So as I just mentioned, the CDN network is built trying to reach um, all the most populous areas in the world. And you and the the, the selection of the pops also uh, depends on the uh, the network connectivity uh, of the region and also the population. And you probably notice that uh, we have a pretty dense distribution uh, in China. It's because uh, the, the China, the diff different ISPs in China has uh, pretty poor uh, connectivity. So we had to uh, build a pop in every major cities and cities. So that's why we end up with, uh, I think around five, 600 pops uh, in China. And in the rest of the world, uh, because BGP can be widely used and the connectivity uh, between different ISPs are better. So we, we don't need that many number of pops, for example, to cover US. And I think most of the CDNs uh, have about uh, 20 to 30 pops to cover the US. Okay. And a, a global CDN company usually uh, should have at least 100 or 200 pops. And CD networks, we have about 1,000 pops uh, all over the world. And this page hopefully can give you some a brief idea about how CDN works. So um, the goal is to accelerate uh, the, the content of a website. So on the far right hand side is the origin server set up by the, the, the CDN customer or a web developer. Okay, they can put the, their website and the, their, their download, uh, maybe may a web page or some uh, download website for the apps, uh, or pictures, images. Uh, on, they, they just set up a web, server, a web server for that purpose and put the content on that server. Okay. But if it's just one server, it's, it will be very difficult to serve the uh, end users from uh, all over the world. Okay. Because usually, even if we put it in, into a data center with the best connectivity, there will always be um, a part of the world that will be difficult to reach that data center. So that's how CDN can, can help. Uh, with the with the widely distributed edge network I just showed you in the previous page, okay, the CDN servers can simply cache content on the origin server, okay, and so so the content will be replicated to uh, all those servers I just showed you all over the world. So whenever a end user, no matter where they come from the end user will be uh, directed by our GSLB to the closest, uh, to, to the closest edge pop to that, to that user. Okay. So the latency will be very small and the user, because the content is cached very close to the uh, end user. So the end user will be able to get the content very, very quickly. So user, user experience can be um, improved a lot. Um, yeah, this, GS, this GSLB actually, I want to mention is that this GSLB also 
plays a very important role in the CDN and in the uh, uh, edge computing platform I'm going to um, describe. Because uh, although we have a very widely uh, distributed network, uh, but if we can't really direct the end user to the closest server, that network is, is basically useless. So how this GSOB works is that uh, it, it is the GSOB is basically a, a smart DNS system. So the uh, the website for uh, CDN they usually expose their service through a host name. So when the end user's browser or, or the client trying to reach that uh, website, it needs to go through the DNS resolution process to to get the IP address of that. Uh, host name. So those, we would ask the CDN uh, customer to update their, uh, their DNS record. Um, so that DNS record will be CNAMED to an edge host name provided by our uh, GSLB, which is a authoritative uh, DNS platform. So it will based on, so every DNS request will eventually go to uh, our GSLB and the GSLB DNS server would uh, analyze the uh, people's IP address and based on uh, geo mapping and uh, our, our own probing result and smartly find the closest uh, edge server that will provide the end user the, the best possible uh, experience. And in the meantime, in the past, in all the, days, the CDN servers only provides uh, the storage, the, the caching to the end users. But in recent years, uh, um, the, the CDN companies are uh, adding more and more functionality to the uh, to the edge servers. Um, so to, to expand its capability to do just caching. So for example, uh, a lot of uh, business logics are can be uh, implemented in the uh, CDN edge servers. Um, for example, the uh, some some user uh, access control algorithms you know, can be easily uh, implemented on on the CDN edge servers. So the client does not nearly uh, the option servers does not have to do all those. Uh, uh, algorithms. So the, uh, utilize, the, the, the pressure on the origin service can be greatly reduced. And here are uh, some data regarding the performance of uh, CDN edges. Okay, so this data comes from a company called Citrix. They are basically a third party um, performance uh, monitor company for, for the company and, and, the, and the cloud services. So here we, I'm showing the uh, median latency of the CDN of all the major CDN uh, networks in US and in China. So as you can see this, this column that uh, the median latency for CDN networks are, for CDNs are usually around 20 in the US. And in the US, you can see that this is a very, uh, the, the, the numbers are really tightly packed. The, so we are located at uh, number 17, but the difference between the number one is, uh, is very, very small, just, a, just three milliseconds. So uh, yeah, the, the, the idea is that it's, it's all around 20 milliseconds. And in China, the number is even smaller. The reasons I mentioned, uh, we have to build, the CTN companies has have to build a lot more parks in China. And so because, because of that, the, the latency in China is even smaller, usually around uh, 12, 13 days second. And by the way, I see that the CD networks is uh, the only uh, major CTN company that uh, doing well in both countries. Oh yeah, and uh, Quantil, is a sister company of CD Networks. So this gives you some idea about the, the performance of the CDN uh, edge networks. Let's see how we can use it. 
but yeah, so this page uh, gives you another comparison between the conventional cloud, meaning AWS, Azure, and you know, Google Cloud versus the CDN paths. Okay. The first one is the, the number of uh, paths, the number of paths globally. Okay. As I mentioned, uh, the conventional cloud usually have 10 or 20 uh, data centers you know, all, all over the world. And CDN has uh, over uh, at the order of 1,000 paths. Okay. So 100 times more than the conventional cloud. Uh, however, as a result, you know, the, the size of the pop is, is much smaller. The, the cloud would have easily have a millions of uh, CPU cores uh, in each data center. Uh, CN usually um, a few thousand. So, yeah, so of course you, you cannot you can get both, right? You cannot have a 100 times uh, more pop, but you have the same number of pops. You have to sacrifice something. And the total bandwidth, this, the CDN should be also a few orders of magnitude. This bandwidth is not per path, it's the collectively combined bandwidth of all the paths. Okay. So CDNs usually add tens of terabits. Okay. So some of our customers um, can actually uh, fully use more than 10 t tbps you know, at some of their peak time. And cloud, uh, the bandwidth can provide it to each user. Uh, it's usually uh, capped at a few hundred GPPS. Uh, uh, yeah, it also depends on the, uh, the, the the connectivity of the end users. Okay, the latency, as I just showed, the CDN latency is around at an order of uh, ten milliseconds, and the cloud is usually at uh, around one hundred. The single another thing we I want to mention is that the, I want to emphasize is the pop availability, and for for a conventional cloud, of course, uh, they have to uh, have a very very high uh, availability for each of their data centers. Usually, uh, an infinite number of nice point nine 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 large number of paths, as you can imagine that it's very difficult to maintain, to guarantee uh, high availability of each path. Okay. Usually it's around, uh, I would say 95%. Uh, and each path can be shut down without any notice okay, at any time, or maybe because of a power outage or maybe because of uh, network maintenance or hardware failures. Okay. So because we have uh, thousands of paths, it's almost impossible to guarantee the uh, single path availability. But overall, the CDN network can still achieve a very high availability because of the uh, GSLB I just mentioned. I imagine if one pop goes down, the GSLB will be able to sense it immediately and stop directing end users to that, to that pop and directing those requests to some other nearby paths because we have so many paths all over the world. So the end user will hardly um, feel the difference. And the uh, services provided by cloud and CDN is also uh, very different. On cloud, they have a, a whole lot of services. Uh, CDN usually uh, mostly provides caching, and it, it can also provide uh, you know, security and some um, also dyna dynamic acceleration. But compared to cloud, it's, uh, it will be very limited, and that that is not the goal of CDN. Okay. So the is that the CDN has a large number of pops, much smaller latency. And there's no guarantee of each of the high uh, of the availability of each pop, but overall it can still achieve very high availability. So how can we utilize this uh, CDN or existing CDN network to provide uh, 
match computing as a service. So there are some uh, basic uh, thoughts we had. So the first one is that the edge computing should not be cloud computing with lots of parts. So as I mentioned in the previous page, you know, the cloud computing, they provide a lot of different services and including database, um, you know, uh, virtual machine, VMs, and uh, containers, you know, all, all sorts of uh, different services, you name it. But um, for edge computing, it's you know, technically, first of all, technically it's impossible for, for us to make sure you know, each of our pop can provide all those services. So this is not available. So, yeah, so the first one I want to mention is that edge computing should not be cloud computing with lots of pops. They have to, they have to be, uh, each pop has to be uh, simple and easy to maintain. So the second one is that uh, the high availability should be achieved through GSLD you know, collectively uh, using all, all the uh, edge paths. So we shouldn't, or the, the application should not rely on high availability of each path. Yeah, and the third one is space because each path may go down at any time. Okay, so this is something uh, that application designer need to keep in mind. And we believe that this sh shouldn't be a problem at all. I want to talk a little bit more about the state list. So what I'm, uh, what I'm saying here is that the module running on the edge should be stateless. This does not mean that the application, the entire application has to be stateless. We understand that uh, each application will definitely need to save some states about, uh, uh, about, the, log about the business. Right? So we, we are just saying that we need to, uh, the application need to divide uh, into different modules. And only the module running on the edge should be stateless. Okay. So the state can still be stored on a uh, conventional cloud or uh, even stored in the uh, end user's device on, on their phone. So some people may say that uh, my application, well, for some reason, okay, my application really need to have state on the edge. Okay. So what should we do? So my answer is that uh, that is fine, okay. but you have to be aware of the consequences. So it sounds scary, but what, what are exactly the, the consequences? The consequences is basically that because uh, you, you need to have those state, those uh, persistent data on the edge. That means if that edge goes down, okay, so some of users will be, some of the end users will be seriously affected because those state are not stored on the other edges. So we cannot use a simply uh, redirect that those users request to another edge to quickly recover the, uh, the service for those users. So maybe it will take some time you know, to rebuild those state on the edge. So the, uh, the service resumption won't be seamless. And uh, you know, also another case is that if, if the user is moved, uh, so uh, if if the service if the logic on the edge is stateless, so we can uh, when the user moves from one region to a different region, you know, the, the the service can be seamlessly switched from one one of our edge path to another edge path quickly. But if you have to have state. Uh, on the edge, that means uh, this kind of a handoff will be uh, very difficult or impossible. Okay, so yeah, this is another trade-off. We highly suggest that the app developers can divide their, their application into uh, different modules and run the stateless part on the edge. Okay. And uh, how to, 
from the edge surface. Okay, that's another critical question. So uh, in our implementation, because we, we believe that uh, Kubernetes has been very widely used nowadays by the uh, by a lot of edge uh, by a lot of uh, application developers, and it's very convenient to to manage and to developer to develop. So we decide that uh, we will just leverage uh, Kubernetes. Okay. So we in our implementation we are deploying uh, the Kubernetes on every edge pop and. Uh, but manage it by a central console. Okay. So the customer or the uh, app developers, what they do is that they, they build the pods uh, in, in their own Kubernetes. Okay. They can test in their own environment. Okay, when everything is done, they just upload the YAML file okay, on the console and our system would dis distribute um, the pods to every pod all over the world. And in the meantime, they should expose the service through a domain name, okay, such that the GSLD will be able to route the end users to the fastest path for the end users. Okay, so this is our view of how uh, edge service should look like. Okay, so this is a, another picture showing that uh, uh, what we believe how a uh, edge as a service platform should look like. As you can see, it's very, very similar to the uh, previous picture of uh, the CDN. So basically, um, the application should also have a central server, uh, for example, to save the state data, okay, the state for data, and also probably also running the stateful part of the, uh, of the logic. And uh, the application should run the stateless part on the edge servers, what we call edge application servers. Okay. And between the, the edge servers would still communicate with the central server. The um, bandwidth compared to the edge bandwidth should be much smaller. That's pretty similar to the, you know, uh, to the CDN case. Okay. And the end users would be able to reach the closest edge server by uh, through the GSLD. Yeah. So the end, the end, the, uh, the client can uh, issue uh, larger, can, can send or receive a large amount of data, large amount of data uh, between the uh, edge servers. Okay. But the edge servers should not um, in a way that the application should be designed in a way that the uh, traffic between the edge server and the central server should be minimized. Okay. To, 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 be min uh, to be minimized in a way such that it's you know, the, the central data center handle. Okay. It does not need to be a very small. Um, if the uh, cloud data center can support uh, 100 GPPS, you know, it's, it's, 100 GPPS is fine as long as the central data center and the central server can handle it. Okay, but here, uh, and usually go above um, tera BPS or 10 tera BPS. Okay. Uh, yeah, so here um, is uh, what the app application should do uh, to take full advantage of uh, any edge, edge computing platform. Okay, I, uh, basically, I have already mentioned most of them. So first, uh, we expect that the uh, application should be modularized, modularized. Okay, so the high bandwidth and latency sensitive and relatively low computation and a stateless part should be deployed on the edge computing platform. Okay, high bandwidth, latency sensitive. Okay. I, will, I will show a few uh, examples later. And the low latency uh, the low bandwidth latency insensitive high computation stateful part should be deployed on uh, the conventional cloud. Okay. So edge computing is not supposed to take over the uh, conventional cloud computing. Okay. They definitely need to, um, to work with each other. Okay. And some other uh, 
parts of the app, for example, the UI and the low computation part and also the stateful part can be, can be stored on the device, such as the, the, the mobile phone. Okay, and since we have uh, this large number of pops, and we believe that for different pops to communicate uh, and discover each other, we can uh, create a central service, uh, some kind of a directory service for each pop to register themselves and discover each other to syn synchronize data directly. Okay, so yeah, right now I'm trying to show a few uh, applications and also non-applications for ECP. ECP is not supposed to, to do anything, to do everything. So you know, I also want to you know, give some example of non-application. Okay, the first possible very good example is uh, cloud gaming or edge gaming if we use edge computing. So the, the module partition can be that uh, the process, uh, uh, for, for a gaming application, there's a lot of control signals between the, uh, the console and the server. So those uh, process, those control signals, 3D rendering, uh, basically the UI, uh, the 3D rendering and the video compression uh, can be deployed on the ECP, the, uh, the, the edge computing platform. Okay. And each player progress um, and uh, those data and, and those data and also analyze uh, the, the end user's data can be deployed on the conventional cloud. Those are considered uh, the state for data and also probably involves a high computation, requires a lot of uh, storage in the CPU. So those can be deployed on con conventional cloud. And those uh, logics are not really uh, sensitive. It does, does not affect the user's experience. Okay. And on the Oh, and on the device, you know, we can we need to do a video decompression to display the videos and also send the control signals to the edge servers. So a significant part can be deployed on edge computing, which does not require a state. Uh, the state, uh, the the edge servers can reach the conventional cloud to to get the state for data. It does not really need to save it locally. Okay. This is mobile uh, cloud gaming. Yeah, and then in the multi multiplayer case, um, you know, we, all, we we only support players uh, in the same geographic region. It does, you know, but it, it depends. But for most games, uh, especially um, those are latency sensitive games, this does not make sense to support multiple players in very different regions uh, across the earth. Because uh, the latent still always uh, determined by the speed of light by our mother nature, so if the if the, if that latency is too high, does not really make sense. But for edge computing, you know, the, the pops can can easily find the pops close uh, to its, uh, the, the 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 use of the players in the nearby geographic regions can still be uh, supported. Okay. Another typical example we believe is the artificial intelligence. intelligence. Now, for example, Google Lens or the Apple Street. Okay. So those uh, applications, you usually just take an image, take a picture, or you record a video, and you send those uh, multimedia uh, files to some uh, cloud server to analyze Okay, to run some AI uh, algorithms and then return the result. Okay. And we believe that this part, this first part can be, uh, is a very suitable application for uh, edge computing. And especially if the application is uh, latency sensitive. For example, in the case of Siri, when you say something to your phone, you would expect it, you would expect it to, uh, to respond to you in, um, in a very short time. You don't want to wait for uh, 10 seconds for the CV to answer your question. And yeah, and the, yeah, and that part is uh, AI inferencing. And in, in, in most cases, AI the computation requirement for AI inference, inferencing should be uh, very suitable to be deployed to uh, edge servers. But the um, AI models uh, needs to be 
uh, continuously updated. So the machine learning algorithm uh, updating the neural network can still be deployed on central cloud because of the uh, large amount of uh, computing resources. And on the device, of course, we can uh, collect the image, record audio, display the result should still be uh, deployed on the end user's device. Okay. And another good example should be augmented reality, the AR. Okay. So in those uh, applications, you would, uh, shoot a video and you uh, superimpose some uh, 3D models on those videos. So uh, the first part, so receive the, the, the mobile device will take a video and uh, live stream it to the edge server. So the edge server receive those video and does some uh, AI inferencing and generate and superimpose the, uh, the 3D object uh, to the video and compress the video, send it back to the device. So, that part is again uh, requires a lot of data exchange and requires low latency but the computation is not very high and it's completely stateless so it's another uh, very good example to be deployed to uh, ECP computing. again the machine learning part updating the neural network can still be done on conventional cloud and taking the video display the result can still be done on on the end device So the last one is a uh, what I call a non-application. So people when, talk, when people are talking about edge computing, a lot of them are talking about uh, IoT. Uh, here I just want to say that uh, an IoT application does not automatically mean uh, ECP, the edge computing should be used. Uh, for example, if we need to analyze the real-time data of a thousand sensors in in a factory, because this, uh, we, we believe that uh, the edge computing is designed for geographically um, distributed applications. So if it's just a whole, a lot, whole lot of sensors in one factory, it's still geographically concentrated. It, it's, uh, it does not really benefit from edge computing. So the conventional uh, infrastructure should still be used like the, the conventional cloud, either in data center or on premises should be still a better um, solution for this kind of application. So that's not, I, IoT does not automatically mean CP. Okay. Yeah, that's, that, this is the last page I have. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'm ready for some uh, Q&A. Thank you very much, Dr. Ni, nee, for a wonderful presentation. Um, we have about 12 minutes for questions. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A box. And we will get to as many as we can before the hour ends. Mm -hmm. Uh, if there's oh, okay. Okay, we have a question here. What was the reason that China has more POPs compared to other continents? Oh, um, it's because the the, the uh, ISPs in China they usually have a, a worse uh, interconnectivity between them. 
uh, for example, China Mobile and China Telecom, they, for, for some reason, they don't want to, they don't want their customers or they don't want the, uh, their networks to have a very good peering between them. Okay, so they only peer at a, a few designated places and the bandwidth is uh, usually pretty limited. Um, yeah, so if we have, if we set up a server, for example, in China Telecom, in, in general, we cannot use it to serve end users in China Mobile because the, the connectivity is very bad. So we have, to, for that reason, we have to set up a pop in each one of those uh, ISPs. Okay. And even for some ISP, okay, they across different, the, the connectivity across different province, sometimes it's also very bad within the same ISP. They, I believe they, they, they are doing that on purpose for some uh, commercial reasons they believe that can maximize the benefit so we have to make sure that we really set up a pop in at least in every province okay so china has uh, 30 provinces and and each province is some, some province has a few uh, very populous cities so that means we so all over the country we have uh, we probably need to set up uh, pops in at least 100 cities Okay, and each city has at least a three, four major uh, ISPs. So you multiply 100 by three or four, so that's easily amounts to a three, 400 uh, box. But versus in US, the connectivity between different ISPs are pretty good. You know, BGP is so wide use and uh, the peering bandwidth is usually pretty uh, decent. So we don't need to set up uh, a pop in each data center. Uh, in each ISP, okay, we just need to make sure the pops are uh, geographically uh, well distributed to cover the, the populous uh, regions. So usually 30 to 20 to 30 is good enough to cover US. Excellent. Do we have any other questions at all? Another one, Q and A. Okay, it's a comment. Uh, okay. Yeah, and on yeah, if there's no other questions, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about the cloud versus CDN. Okay, and here I listed some of the major differences, and I want to mention that uh, you know, for, we have a lot of uh, CDN customers. Uh, who are using AWS, for example, AWS S3 as their origin. Okay, so and use our CDN to dis distribute the uh, content uh, they stored on S3. So why they their end users to go directly to S3 to fetch the content? I think that's a very good example of, uh, of uh, the the difference between uh, cloud and CDN. Because S3, S3 does not offer the uh, low latency the customer expected. S3 probably just only uh, located in a very small number of data centers, usually probably just one data center. Okay. So it's very difficult for uh, end users all over the world to reach to that one S3 data center to, to get the content okay. and the connectivity um, from different places of the world to that data center may not be uh, all good. Some areas may even be able to reach that data center. So this is how CDN can be helpful. And even S3 uh, does not, will not be able to support tens of uh, TBBS. But uh, the CDN we easily support that. And so we believe that uh, today's application, although most of today's application are deployed on uh, the cloud, those uh, central central cloud services, but we believe that uh, when the application evolves, when, when they have more uh, widely geographically distributed end uses, and when the demand for bandwidth and the latency uh, increases, 
the conventional cloud will not be able to meet the requirement of those uh, applications. So those applications will definitely uh, have to move to the edge. It, will ben it should benefit a lot from moving to the edge to support those uh, bandwidth and the latency requirements. But, uh, but, but to be honest, but today, you know, I don't think any uh, application would really require 10 Gbps of uh, total uh, bandwidth. So probably that's the reason that we uh, don't see really a, um, a boom of those uh, of edge computing. But uh, we believe you know, eventually that, that day would come. And so today, I think, I think it's more like a chicken and egg uh, problem because the, the app developers, they, they don't know, they probably don't know that there's a, such a platform that can support tens of TBPS of total bandwidth. So no one probably would even think about to design an app that requires that much bandwidth. So they, they um, basically their imagination is limited by the capability of the uh, con conventional cloud. So, yeah, so I, I think that's why we um, want to share our ideas through this uh, platform to let more people know that, more uh, app developers know that such kind of a platform actually exists. So we believe that once this message is out, more and more developers would be uh, more brave, will be brave enough to design uh, more apps that can, uh, can take advantage of the large bandwidth and the small latency um, provided by the edge networks. We have another question here. 10 BPS is shared among all users. Perhaps per user can still be limited. What could be a reasonable bandwidth for a developer to target? Uh, 10 TBPS, if you feel 10, P, 10, 10 TBPS is not big enough, I would say that because not, not first of all, not all users will uh, connect it to the server, will use the service simultaneously, right? So actually 10, TBPS is probably uh, the maximum collective bandwidth we have seen in our CDN business. Okay, and that, that that's yeah. In, in that application, they also have uh, millions of users uh, downloading at the same time. And the, yeah, the bandwidth the, the bandwidth of each connection. Um, most still mostly still depends on the the connectivity of end user, but based on our measurement, it's, it can easily reach more than ten megabps. Yeah, and, yeah. Do we have anyone else with a question? Anyone at all? All right. Not having any other questions. Uh, one, one. Dr. Ni, nee, uh, yeah, uh, since we don't have any questions coming in, Dr. Ni, nee, um, do you have any um, closing words for today's webinar? Uh, 
Yeah, as I said, that uh, I hope that uh, people can um, help to uh, pass this message to more and more developers, so we can, uh, as a as a community, we can uh, make this uh, edge as a service a reality, and more more and more people will be aware of it and take advantage of it. So we can build more um, powerful apps to uh, to serve the end users. Excellent. Well said. Well, that uh, just about does it for today's CNCF webinar. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ben Nee for a wonderful presentation and uh, for taking time out of his day to join us. I'd like to thank all the attendees for taking time out of their day as well for um, attending today's webinar. Everyone take care and stay safe, and we will see you at the next CNCF webinar. Bye.